NFL podcast. He's actually married, but have you met my friend Wes? Welcome back to another edition of the Around the NFL podcast. My name is Dan Hansis, and I am joined by a room filled with heroes. Mark Sessler, Chris Wessling, and Greg Rosenthal. What's up, boys? Hey, Dan. Welcome, Sunday Night Recap Show. What a big Sunday to talk about. It was a fun one. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of NFL action. Uh, the NFL, never been better, or so I've been told to say. Spread that. That's <laughs> the new slogan that, we're, that the NFL is pushing out to the masses. That uh, couldn't be further from the truth. No, but that's... Uh, that could know, be. I might bring it up in the next... You know, when they have those town halls? Mm. Uh, and it's like, anybody raise your hand? This is your chance. I'll just be like, hand up. Got a new slogan we could push out there. <laughs> the NFL, never been better. That would ignore, like, everything that's happened in the last 11 months. <laughs> I, well, off the field, you could make some... And off on the, the field, field, it's a pretty good product. People talk about the 70s. Oh, yeah, let's, uh, let's bring back, you know, 12 to 7 with no passing game. You? Go, go watch that. Did sure. we ignore the officiating this year? I was going to say, that was my other That's slogan true. that I was working on, you probably would hate. Catch rule, nailed it. <laughs> now that's good. We don't even know if you nailed it. We have to replay that. That's true. This, uh, yeah, so this is the first uh, week of the regular season, uh, or the first, the beginning of the end of the season. Let me get this. No buys mm. for the rest of the way. And I think this is the week the season really starts in earnest in terms of, you know, the playoff positioning. It's kind of like Thanksgiving on, that's what matters. A lot of people view it that way. And we had the three Thanksgiving games, of course, uh, that you could actually check out on NFL Now. Greg and I recapped at Thanksgiving night. Uh, we won't recap the game here on this show because we got more pertinent things, more timely things to get to, which is the rest of the Sunday slate. And there are a lot of good games to uh, talk about here. We had one of the best games of the season, I thought. Wes, you wrote it up, so we're going to tee you up on that in a couple of minutes. The Steelers and Seahawks, a shootout at uh, CenturyLink Field. Uh, Adrian Peterson, uh, listen, a few years ago, he ran for 2,000 yards, won the MVP. You're not hearing MVP attached to his name this year, but he's still having a monster season. He did it again on Sunday. And, uh, of course, we're going to talk about it. It was supposed to be Brady, Ma Brady Manning ball, ball, potentially the last one. We didn't get it. It's Brock Osweiler versus Tom Brady uh, in snowy Denver. Sunday night football with Alan Chris, Mark. We're going to talk about that, too. Every Sunday. Al Chris yes. and Bob is the way Mark likes to put it for Bob Costas, his number one uh, dream guy. I heard from about one Twitter follower that <laughs> about one. stood with me on the Bob Costas side. <laughs> that shows the, the worst part. Support. The worst part of Sunday for Mark uh, is the timing of when we start doing this recap show. An old bloviator Costas is just about to get up on his soapbox at halftime, and you don't get a chance to soak it in. I don't, I don't sure soak it DVR, that in. That is, it's it's pre nineteen ninety five Costas that I find to be. Uh, a great broadcaster. Post okay. then? Who knows? It's, it's up to him. We circled back to the Costas conversation. Why, we saw why that coming. <laughs> Leaving Wes in the cold for two straight weeks. I just never got the Bob Costas controversy. It's, Who mean, cares it, that much about Bob Costas? Well, Mark does. That's why. I don't well, that, is, I, that is absolutely cooked. I don't even that. know if it's a bit or not. That's exactly it. You almost think, how could it be serious? But, mm. And yet Mark is. He loves Bob Costas. Or, or I told it. I'm told that I am. Okay. <laughs> Listen, one we'll, of the two. we'll pick this up, the Bob Costas pop, podcast, one of our off-season podcasts on our rapidly growing around the NFL network um, coming up in the off-season. But now, let's get to games. Let's talk football. That's what we're here for. We're the Around the NFL podcast, damn it. And why don't we start, Chris Wessling, in Seattle? Because guess what? Do not count out the Seahawks. If you do, you are a fool. Russell Wilson outdueled Ben Roethlisberger, throwing five touchdown passes without a pick. Is that correct? No picks. A 39-30 to 30 shootout win over the Steelers. The win moves Seattle into the sixth and final playoff spot in the NFC for right now, Wes. Let me ask you a question. Will they stay here? Sure. Who's going to beat them? That's a good question. The, we thought the Buccaneers might be frisky, and they lose to the Colts. The Colts, contrary to what Greg's saying, are not that good of a team. I don't know who else. The Falcons have been horrible for the last month or six weeks, so who's going to knock off the Seahawks? Wes loves to tell me the Colts are terrible right before they win another game, but let's hear about this game. Well, it was it's hard to say whether it was magnificent quarterbacking or atrocious secondary play. I lean towards the quarterbacking. It was one of Russell Wilson's guest, best games I've ever seen from the pocket. The most touchdown passes he's ever had, the second most yards he's ever had. 
Uh, and then Ben Roethlisberger continues to be the best deep ball thrower in the NFL. Gorgeous. He made some incredible throws. This was a fascinating fourth quarter, back and forth. It was like a Russian novel with plot twists and turns all over the place. Mm. Lead changes. Uh, the Steelers on the wrong end of a series of, of officiating calls. How many well, games this year have we seen the Seahawks win outright with a huge outpouring on offense versus... You know, their defense is not the same this season. They're having to do it on offense. They've allowed 30 points or more three times this year, including twice at home, which hadn't happened since 2010. Again, Greg pointed this out earlier today. Earl Thomas has been on the wrong end of a lot of highlight, highlight real plays, including Martavis Bryant's 11-yard end-around touchdown today. And their secondary is just Kerry Williams was a healthy scratch today, one of the biggest free agent flops. I don't know if there's any answers in that secondary. Well, they brought back Jeremy Lane today. He made a couple plays, also gave up a couple plays. But I think it's a great – if you're a Seahawks fan, I know the defense struggled against the best passing attack down the field in the entire league. But it's a great sign. You've just put your two best offensive games of the season in back-to-back -back weeks. And, and that's then you, 500 yards last week and then this one. It's absolutely a great sign. Uh, and balanced out by the loss of Jimmy Graham, who's out for the year, undergoing surgery for a patellar tendon tear. The dreaded torn patellar tendon, so that could have long-term consequences for Graham as a uh, Pro Bowl-type talent. Also, in other injury news in this game, Ben Roethlisberger um, left late in the game with a, uh, a head injury. I don't know if it was diagnosed as a concussion, but he was forced out of the game, uh, and Landry Jones came on through the pick. That uh, game was basically decided at that point, but once Roethlisberger exited, it was over. We see the Steelers as the best wild card team in, other, in either conference, I think, and, and their offense is that. When you watch them, they're like the AFC's version of the Cardinals without Patrick Peterson and Tyron Matthew. Their secondary is a mess, but Ben Roethlisberger, ben Roethlisberger any game he plays in, He's going to be the best quarterback unless he's playing the Patriots. I disagree in terms of the best wild card possibility because I think the Seahawks are just because they've done it for three straight years on defense and they still have those players. And I think the way that they're coming around on offense, they're the team that could absolutely win the title, I believe, this year. Now, we, we just saw, on if you're watching on YouTube, where you can see all of our Sunday shows, Roethlisberger nice went out run. after a running play near the goal line. It's fourth and goal. They're at about the three. Tomlin chooses to go for a field goal there to give the ball back to Seattle. I was a little surprised. I don't know if his injury impacted that per decision or not, but I was a little surprised Tomlin didn't just go for it there, try to win the game with a touchdown. My, my initial reaction was lack of onions by Mike Tomlin, but you bring up a good point because if there was a situation with Roethlisberger, and there probably was a pretty good chance that that might have been factored in because something was going on with Roethlisberger, then maybe you could take it, take the heat off him. But I, I felt like the game was over once they kicked the field goal because they weren't able to stop Seattle all night. I don't think it's a lack of onions. This is a team that went for two-point conversions over and over. In this have, game. have all season long done that when Big well, they did it healthy. When this it came, called for it. This so. came after Mike Tomlin said at halftime, we're not going to live in our fears, we're going to live in our hopes. Ooh. With that kind of philosophy, you should be going for the touchdown. Go you should it. because if you don't get it there, you can still get your stop on defense. So it's not about having faith in the defense. I mean, you can get your stop and then try to score the touchdown when you get the ball back. It's giving you two bites at the apple instead of one. Now, they get Russell Wilson in a third and 12, I believe it was. They send the blitz at him, and that's the play of the game to me. Russell Wilson delivers. They get the free blitzer. Bud Dupree coming right up the middle a little late, and he delivers right against the, the blitz for a nice pass to Doug Baldwin. Takes it all the way. Steelers couldn't tackle. They couldn't tackle most of the day, and too many wide receivers running free in the secondary. Russell Wilson does deserve a lot of credit in this game because he hasn't typically been this quarterback that can – carry an offense with his arm. He's always been just a great piece of a solid offense that relies on the run. This time they needed him, and he stepped up. That's a very good sign for Seattle as well. What you said about keeping him in the pocket, that was their game plan, and it worked, and he beat him. So that, I mean, if, if Russell Wilson starts winning games where he's just slinging it from the pocket, which is going to be tougher without Jimmy Graham. People want to kill the Jimmy Graham uh, trade, and then on a lot of levels, didn't make sense. He's still an above average starting he tight made, end in, the, in he, the league. He made a phenomenal play today right. on a jump ball right near the goal line, too, a 37 yard completion, I believe. 
I still don't think it's a season ender for them on offense to lose Jimmy Graham with the way that he's been plugged into that operation from the start. Oh, you got Luke Wilson's I mean, a good player. Luke Wilson probably can take most of the production that Jimmy Graham was They didn't get. have Jimmy Graham last year, and they went to the Super Bowl. Right. Barely had him this year. He was just not a part of What do you have, two touchdowns? He was a part of the he offense. He had him. He wasn't scoring He had points. 600 yards for a tight end yeah. for 11 weeks. There were moments. I would, it was about a month ago. He had a couple good games in a row. This game, he was playing pretty well. This is a career-changing surgery. People don't come back from patellar tendons as well, patellar tendons as, well as they do from ACL and Achilles. All right, let's move on. The Minnesota Vikings are again sitting atop the NFC North by themselves. Adrian Peterson ran for 158 yards and two touchdowns, leading the Vikings to a 20-10 win over the fading Atlanta Falcons. Chris Wessling, Minnesota might not blow us away on a week-to-week -week basis, but they know who they are. They do. They have a winning formula. Adrian Peterson and a good defense. And Peterson is hitting his stride. The offensive line is blocking better. He's averaging 127 yards, rushing uh, it, over the past five weeks. And I think the defense, Anthony Barr had a great game, had two forced fumbles, a uh, strip sack in the fourth quarter, and a fumble on Tevin Coleman at the end of a long run earlier in the game. Also played good pass defense, knocking the ball away from Tevin Coleman down the sideline. Those were the stars of the game, Peterson and Anthony Barr. It seems like a very good run blocking line, or they're getting better that way, but the last few Vikings games I watched, Teddy Bridgewater's getting hit a lot. So it sounds like from that side of it, they're struggling. He, a lot of that's on him. He's a great scrambler, but he has to know when to slide and when to throw the ball away. And he's taking these hits that aren't the fault of the offensive line. They're the fault of Teddy Bridgewater. Wes was trying to convince me uh, before these games started that this game didn't matter at all, even though it was two teams that would have been in the playoffs you know, going into today. Because the Falcons, you said their season was over. Even going into this game at 6-4, and four, no, you're no definitely in, ready to stick a fork in them if we could right now at 6-5. and five. No game involving the Falcons is a big game because they stink. I mean, they're <laughs> a bad team. They've lost, what, 5-6? to six? In some of these games to bad, bad teams, they've lost. They're not, beat, they're not even losing to good teams. This is they're the lucky they're not 3-8. and eight. Yeah, that's fair. This is the first win the Vikings have had over a winning team all season. It might be the only win that they get over a team with a winning record all season, and I still would expect, fully expect them to get to the playoffs looking at their schedule. I think they're definitely going to get a couple more wins. I would, too. You take away the Packers' loss. This defense is legitimate. I mean, it's not their fault that they didn't play a lot of winning teams because they had the league's easiest schedule up until about three weeks ago, but they took care of business, too. And I see a Mike Zimmer defense that's getting better every week. All, all bets are off in the NFC North now uh, because after what happened on Thursday night in Green Bay, and we talked about it on NFL Now, Greg, that was one of the more shocking outcomes of the season. I thought the Bears were being led to slaughter, and the Packers again showed how flawed they are. And now you see the Vikings taking care of business week after week, and you can no longer assume the Packers are just going to get back on track. The Vikings might win this division and be in really good position in January. They probably have the best, even though the Packers' defensive line outplayed them when the two of them played. On paper, they have the best defensive line. If you want to throw Barr in there, front seven, really, of that division. Barr is fun to watch week after week. I mean, when you're thinking of like a 2015-style linebacker who's that dynamic in pass coverage, I mean, he makes plays in pass coverage every week. He's really the NFC's version of Jamie Collins, but... Probably a little. If I had to choose one of them, I might take. I would take Barr even long term. As good as Jamie Collins is. What about Xavier Rhodes? You mentioned that he did a nice job against Julio Jones. He did, and he hasn't had a good season. This was a this was a good game for him, but he he's been kind of weak all season. But Julio Jones was almost a non-factor, and I think we have to start asking about Kyle Shanahan mm. because Matt Ryan he doesn't have a lot to work with here. You've got Julio Jones near the line of scrimmage, but where's their downfield attack? You've got Matt Ryan throwing to Justin Hardy. Julio Jones, Leonard Hankerson was out, Roddy White basically doesn't exist anymore, and Jacob Tamming is a slow-moving tight end, so they have no downfield element in their passing they, attack at all. They even threw the ball a lot in Cleveland with Brian Hoyer downfield mm. for a big chunk of the season, and it was around now that that offense started to fall apart completely, too. But you're also getting mind-numbing interceptions from Matt oh, Ryan. Oh, it was a, it was a terrible they, game. They could have been in that game in the first half if he hadn't made, if he just didn't make mental errors in the kick field. It was a terrible game by him. I just think he's if you're looking for the reasons why he's not playing well, it's because he doesn't have much beyond Julio Jones. Uh, do you think there's any chance, Wes, that if Roddy White, you know, listens to the show, he might hear your comment that he doesn't really exist anymore and just stare in the mirror and just maybe a tear runs down his cheek? It's, I, I, that's a fair point. He exists, but he doesn't really help the Falcons anymore. That's fair enough. Uh, moving on, the Kansas City Chiefs. 
Look at the Kansas City Chiefs. They overcome a slow start, both on the season, Greg, and today. Uh, they lose their star pass rusher, Justin Houston, and still they come out of it with a 30-22 to win over those up-and-down Buffalo Bills at Arrowhead on Sunday. Uh, Mr. Rosenthal, the boss, as you insist we call you. I've never once. Um, okay. <laughs> Have the Chiefs gone from AFC afterthought to wild card favorite? I think they're making the playoffs. I thought that before today. I thought they were going to romp over the Bills. It was a little more complicated. But what I liked is that you mentioned it. They're down 10 nothing. Their offense won this game, and it started with Jeremy Macklin. Jeremy Macklin wow. absolutely destroyed Ronald Darby. He's not going to be ranked number Darvo? two in pro football focus after this performance. A lot of underthrown deep balls by Alex Smith that the Macklin made a play for. You've seen Macklin, if you're watching on YouTube, make a diving play over and over he beat Darby deep Darby also gave up a touchdown to Travis Kelsey when they took him off uh, Jeremy Macklin I just thought it was a great wide receiver performance in their last seven drives of the well, game it's about time right well he's played I think he's been what they they expected for him this season in their last seven drives of the game the Bills didn't get a stop that was it seven straight drives where it was either a touchdown a field that goal or Rex a Ryan's goal. defense every no Chiefs Chiefs fourth string running back put 115 yards on Rex Ryan's $200 million defensive line. When it was 10 0 and they turned the game around, it was Macklin and it was Spencer Ware breaking tackles. I mean, he ran really hard all day. And I heard from some Bills fans on Twitter saying, oh, well, we're missing our two defensive linemen. The Chiefs lost three offensive linemen starters during the game. So. Uh, pi yeah, pipe down, Bills. They also lost Justin Easton in the game, as you're saying, and Jamal Charles a month ago. You're not play the injury card. I, I thought it was a really telling game for the coaches. Reed's an offensive coach. He loses. He doesn't have the most talented team in the world anyways, but he loses uh, a number of players during the game. The Bills' defense is banged up, and they lose Alex Carrington. They lose some players during the game, and the Chiefs' offense put it on that's you Andy said, Reed just taking out Rex Ryan. You said last week that Rex Ryan's blunders on an NFL Now hit would cost this team mm. a victory. Awesome. Were you correct? Oh, my God. I didn't even remember that. Oh, Rex crimes. That is true. <laughs> there were some Rex crimes. Workshop that title. But. It, it, uh, <laughs> it happened in a replay. The decision to either call for replays or not killed them all day. He went 0 for 2 calling for replays, and he failed to do it twice. And, if you're again, if you're watching on YouTube, you can – See a catch that was clearly a catch by Chris Hogan. He takes three steps, he falls, and then he drops the ball. That would have been a first. Uh, no, no, no. I got to defend the Rex game. Ryan here. Nothing in the NFL is clearly a catch. I know. That's a this catch. One, that that, that is ridiculous. not clearly a catch. That's five steps. That's not that clearly replay, a catch. He took sorry. four steps, then he hit the ground. He was never going to the that ground. That is not called consistently. I'm sorry, but I can't kill Rex. But worth a it, challenge. It doesn't matter. You had to take the challenge there. He ended up using right. one the next play on, on what was a clear uh job by Tyron Taylor where he didn't get the first down. And then the game's over. That was literally the second to last play of the game. That would have been first down. They were down eight. I mean, it would have been tough to drive the field and score to tie it, but that, that was Rex it. Ryan's in-game coaching ability is not uh, amongst the league leaders. We'll put it that way. He's, to he's say a defensive the wizard uh, when, he's on, when he's on his game, and he gets along well with his players. But that stuff is going to – that's part of the Rex experience, head-scratching in-game move. I get that he's a defensive wizard, but – with the talent that Buffalo has and what they produce this season, that title does not deserve to stick with Rex Ryan no matter the result week after week. They, if they, unless they're playing New England and the Patriots, they don't seem to get up for games. What, I mean, you, I think you're absolutely right on that. And the most ridiculous thing was the excuse making afterwards. He, bl he blamed Arrowhead Stadium for not showing enough replays on the stadium. Come on, Rex. First of all, every home team Come doesn't on, show Rex. the replays when it's questionable and it might hurt your team. Second of all, you have people upstairs watching TVs, the same TVs that we are. That is, it's insane. Uh, again, yep. I'm, I'm just impressed by this Chiefs team. Ramba right. Ali, by the way, had a great, great game. Good C year. Great year. C plus so far, at best, maybe Rex Ryan's debut in Buffalo. That's generous. Yeah, yeah maybe. It's all going to cut. You make the playoffs or you don't. That's what he came in saying he was going to do with the same bluster and wind and as always. And if they don't, it's a failure because they've had a lot of games where they look like a disaster. And he's gotten much better quarterback play than he could have hoped for. I mean, they, they dominated this game early. 202 yards to 29 in the first 25 minutes of the game. Sammy Watkins had 156 yards before halftime. And then he didn't have a, he had only had one target after half. Jim That's, Schwartz better yeah, that, job with this defense. Uh, by the way, it, it is warrants mentioning Alex Smith beleaguered around these parts. 
283 pass attempts now without an interception, stretching all the way back to week three. That is the fourth longest streak in NFL history. It will never surprise me if Alex Smith doesn't throw interceptions. He, he, they dropped a couple. The Bills dropped a couple today. The streak should have ended, but I loved Alex Smith kept throwing the ball downfield. The most he had in well. week one. Uh, moving on, the Houston Texans keep winning, uh, led by another disruptive performance from J.J. Watt. The Texans kept pace with the Colts atop the AFC South, a 24-6 win over the Saints, who stink. Mark, Brian Hoyer stepped back in the, stepped back in the lineup and kept Houston humming, huh? Yeah, I mean, it help, their schedule is helping them right now. You play New Orleans, that's going to, you know, Brian, Cush, Brian Hoyer coming off a concussion. Great game to come back into completes his first 11 passes and again there's nothing spectacular about Brian Hoyer but he runs this offense very capably and they're getting a lot of different players to contribute I think he hit nine different receivers today you know they've got no great running back to speak of but they managed to control the game on the ground at time as well New Orleans it's their defense I mean honestly Houston is probably soaring towards potentially a wild card spot if some of these other teams tumble but the bigger issue for me is New Orleans. This team needs to completely reboot the machine. If you are a Brian Hoyer fan, this stat is the best stop possible stat you could use as a trump card. He has started 22 of his team's previous 43 games, of his last 43 games. Those teams are 14-8 and eight with Hoyer in the lineup and 3-18 and 18 without Brian mm. Hoyer. Wow. It makes you think that although... Give Bill O'Brien some credit for at least realizing his mistake and apologizing to his team for the Ryan Mallett misfire. Uh, but what would have happened if he just let Hoyer play from September on? Maybe they'd be all alone right now in first place. But the point is he's playing well, and he doesn't even have to play that great because the defense, again, listen, Drew Brees and the Saints aren't Drew Brees and the Saints anymore, yeah. or they haven't been for much of this season. But that's still shutting this team down, no touchdowns. I mean, the Saints, they've been – what they've been on offense for so long that 300 330 straight games of 300 or more yards snap today mm. drew Brees 45 games with a touchdown snap today it's starting to crumble because they we, t we heard all offseason you want to base this offense around your run game they gave mark ingram nine carries and i get it you're down early because brian hoyer isn't afraid to throw the ball downfield you get down into a 14 nothing hole but there was more than three and a half quarters left you could have used Ingram to get back in this game. It's the best weapon. They have no semblance of a downfield pass attack. We, I feel like we've been spending most of the year trying to come up with defensive player of the year candidates. Josh Norman and Tyron Matthew are worthy. Luke Keithley is making a run, but J.J. Watt is still the best player in the league. And this defense has given up 35 points in the last four games. J.J. Watt is on pace for 20 sacks again, and he just became the second – Second youngest player ever to reach 70 career sacks behind Reggie White. And I think he does, he does it this year. Yeah, he does it every once. Like he was waving at the Saints huddle at one point. I think what I heard him say was, I'm going to come get you. I think he was talking to Breeze. <laughs> and on the very he next right. snap, he came right into the backfield. And if it had not been for Breeze dumping the ball out the last second, it would have been a sack. He had two more later that completely ended Saints drives. He's a wrecking I, ball. I don't want to hear any more about the Saints defense and Saints defensive coordinator. When, when you don't score a touchdown... That's Sean Payton's offense. That hasn't been the same this year. I mean, I think this is the lowest they've scored in the Sean Payton era. This whole thing stinks. It's one of the worst coast teams in the league right now versus one of the best. I don't know if you could say that about the Texans all season, but what they did against the Jets when I rewatched that game with, with TJ, I mean, they were doing an excellent coaching job maximizing what they have. Right they've been now. doing it for over a month. Yeah. Every team they're playing, they're shutting down. All right, moving forward, uh, Matt Hasselbeck. Oh, my goodness, he cannot be defeated. The 40-year-old backup quarterback improved to 4-0 and on the season following a 25-12 win over the Buccaneers. Mark Sessler, Mark Edward Sessler, Matt Hasselbeck, hey. is the only reason this cult season hasn't evolved into a total embarrassment. Well, if Team MVP! As someone who's in my early 40s, I could not be happier with what Matt Hasselbeck has done yes. over the last couple weeks. You know, he looked better this week than he did last week, too. And it, I, I, I watch Andrew Luck on the sideline, and I think that he's learning from watching these performances. Hasselback does not have the strongest arm in the league, but he threw the ball all over the place today. Down the stretch, second half, Dante Moncrief, huge game. T.Y. Hilton, a pair of touchdowns. I mean, they got the job done, and you know do what? You he's, see, do you see, like, Andrew Luck, like, rubbing his beard, like, watching on the field, like, taking a, in knowledge? Uh, it's a quarterback that's never had a chance to watch anyone else that's fair. from his position, and I think he is learning because he is watching another Colts quarterback 
get hit a lot, and have no running game to help him. Frank Gore, what was it? It's like 17 rushes for 24 yards. He was an absolute mm. disaster. He couldn't run the ball last week. It, it's like watching Trenton Richardson all over again. They have no ground game at all. Whoa. It was all Whoa. on Matt Hasselbeck. I'm year. not saying that about Frank Gore. I don't think he's having a great year. No, he, he started out having listen, a good year, he but is, not lately. It is, the, it is coming towards the end, unless he's just simply not healthy right now. He, he's, he, he hurt them over and over today, Frank Gore. Yeah, I believe he's that. He's Gord Gore. Well, I know we're not, and this podcast, we're not allowed to say anything about Frank Gore. But it's <laughs> like, about bottom that. line, no, because it's like a couple That's of a years ago. That's a shot at you. Let me, no, let me no, break no, down. That's a shot at you, Greg. Direct. It's well, coming it's from it's... Gore. Gore's the one that said, don't say this about me. Well, listen, at this point, if you go watch what he's done <laughs> today, eyes are getting wild. go watch this game and tell me what you think about Frank Gore at this point in the season. He's a liability, and this team's going nowhere in the playoffs if it if it counts on the ground game. So you think Bradshaw's looked a lot better? No, Bradshaw did not look a lot better. Today. Like when I watched their game last week, I thought the running backs were the least of their problems. And in general, I don't think Gore's been a problem. They're a terrible run-blocking team in general, and they get blown up. Their running game was not a benefit last week. I couldn't disagree more. Right, I, I agree. I tell you the what running So backs, not a problem, they're not a benefit at all. Today they were a – go watch this tape and tell me that they're not a let problem. Me, let me break it down for you, Greg, because – you love Frank Gore. You, Inconvenient, Inconvenient truth. truth. Oh, yeah. You coined that nickname, I believe? No. Okay. All right. <laughs> Al Gore did. Al, well, and obviously. Now, uh, what Mark is saying is that despite all your uh, statements yeah. uh, that he will never get old and, and not he's succeed, but Mark is saying that that is untrue. Deal with that reality. It's, it's clear he's not, he's not the same guy. I want to come up with a list of the people Mark has said is an absolute disaster. We've got a, <laughs> it should be a sponsored well, segment, the absolute disaster of the week. If there's anything about failure. football, there's failures every single week. These, there's very few players you can count on on a week-to-week -week basis, and Frank Gore right now we is can, not one of those players. We can players. count on West being wrong about the Colts before the game week after week. Keep telling me they're not a team. This team, <laughs> if nothing else, if nothing else, they have shown that they're good when they're behind. I mean, every game they win, yeah. they were down by. 10 points. Are you listening, Dick Sporting Goods? <laughs> Mark's disaster of the week. Never heard somebody crow so much about a 6 and 5 team who was lucky to win their first five games. How lucky would they, if this season ended today, and one of these teams will definitely fall off, but the Colts and Texans are in. Texans don't have to pass anymore. They're, they're in right now. No, they can it's win their insane. division or get in the wild card. It's insane that both of them would be in the playoffs. They've become this year's Bengals. Moving forward. Where were you when Seth Roberts took over the universe? That's my question. The Raiders wide receiver had six catches for 113 yards and two touchdowns to help lead the Raiders to a 24-21 win over the Titans. Chris Wessling, Marcus Mariota did his best to steal this game, but Derek Carr would not be denied. Mariota led a touchdown drive, which let the Titans up by a few points with four minutes to go. Then Derek Carr answered with a nine-play touchdown drive of his own. The touchdown to Seth Roberts, his second of the game, good game by him. But the difference in this game was the difference in weapons between the two quarterbacks. I mean, Carr played a great game but went 20 minutes without a completion in the mm -hmm. second half. And Mariota just has no one to throw to beyond Delaney Walker. It's the same story every week. Someone made the point on Twitter, it's very similar. Watching the Titans, you kind of think of the Raiders last year. A good young quarterback that has no help around him and just needs a, a reboot. Well, I made that point that in was, the Thursday preview and then made go. the point again today. <laughs> yeah, I think that was you. It is Chris the same Weston, thing. Someone on Twitter. Someone on Twitter, <laughs> not the guy in the podcast studio. Anyway, yeah, it's same <laughs> thing. I just didn't want to credit it wrong. Yeah, same Are you thing. undermining Chris Wesseling? Because that's my corner. <laughs> I didn't want to credit it wrong. Someone on Twitter. Well, last year he's throwing to James Jones. By the way, James Jones undermined the Raiders' offense last year and is undermining the Packers' offense this year. And Kembrell Tompkins, these are the guys that Derek Carr was throwing to last year. Now he's got Crabtree, who's making a boatload of money this year. Amari Cooper had a good game today, and Seth Roberts is coming around. I yep. think we can finally stick a fork in the Titans. I know that would be controversial. <laughs> maybe we can bring the Redskins over. back. As Mark uh, Sessler said downstairs, maybe we should stick a fork in the fork. Yeah, I agree. The Chiefs, especially are, after De by the way, Deion Sanders, uh, our colleague, is that what we call him? I don't, I don't know. know. We've never met the man, but uh, you know they have this running segment now on NFL Network where there's a big fork that comes out and they talk about forking teams. Where are the residuals? Is that how business works? I, mean, I don't we know. Got forks by NFL Network, basically. I think yeah, the fork. It hasn't been a good year. The Redskins, the Texans, the Chiefs, the Boston as Dodgers as of, talk of NFL <laughs> Network larceny. Nice. As of as of all. As of right now, we would have three teams wrong, I guess. Well, all I that matters is what happens on. after week 17. That's true. 
Any other thoughts on this game, Chris Wessel? Uh, yeah, the Titans running backs stink more and more every week. David Cobb, what happened? He was our boy. Yeah, he's terrible. So is Antonio Andrews. This Raiders defense allowed 189 yards per game over the last three weeks, and the Titans couldn't move the ball at all. I'm glad the Raiders are. They needed this. We needed the Raiders to stay in the mix a little bit. Yeah, it was it's a little fun to keep them in the fun. mix. Derek really Carr's a fun back. quarterback to watch. He's got touch and a rifle arm. Not many guys have both of those. It, yeah, it was starting to get a little depressing, so it was getting Raiders-y the last couple of weeks. Get a couple of wins, be in the mix around Christmas time. It was like 27 teams with five or six wins, so yeah, That's true. they're in the thick of it. Uh, moving forward, uh, Ryan Fitzpatrick trimmed the beard and glory followed. The quarterback threw four touchdown passes, no turnovers on Sunday, quashing any talks of a Geno Costa reboot, a 38-20 win for the Jets. Over the Miami Dolphins, who uh, have lost any any Dan Campbell karma, there's nothing left. This is the, basically the same team that the Jets beat up on in London. That's what it felt like, that any progress that they had made uh, is no longer there. So they are basically good. We already stuck a fork in the, the Dolphins. But again, forget about the Dolphins at 4-7. and seven. They're out of the picture. And for the Jets, this was a very big win. They're now 6-5. and five. And uh, more importantly, first of all, Fitzpatrick needed to play better after two bad weeks. So it was big for him to play well in mistake-free football, get Brandon Marshall involved, which he did. Eric Decker had another touchdown catch. Uh, so the offense looked a lot better. Uh, but you also needed to kind of cleanse themselves of what's been some poor play for about five weeks. And this team reminded me a little more of the Jets team that I thought was good back in September and October. It gives a Jet fan, and this usually this ends a certain way, but I, I tend to stay positive. There's a little more hope now that maybe this team can get hot again with the Giants up next, and we know the Giants have problems. So what was the difference today as opposed to the last month? Well, I thought it was interesting what Todd Bowles said this week that, you know, they, they found success on off offense early in the year uh, by running the ball and then quick strike offense uh, with passing, no deep, not a lot of deep shots, ball control type of scheme. And he called it, they, they kind of jumped from algebra to trigonometry by trying to uh, put like a deep, uh, deep, more of a deep passing game element to their offense, which is not Ryan Fitzpatrick's strength by any stretch. Him and Marshall had a lot of trouble also, uh, during that losing stretch with deep passes. So they reined it in a little bit, uh, and I think that was the big difference. They went back to algebra. Chris Ivory still doesn't really look like the same guy. He had one really nice run today where he busted five tackles. Uh, on a 30-some-odd some yard touchdown run. Uh, but, yes, the short passing, Fitzpatrick not showing any, uh, any issues with the thumb. Uh, they look good today. But the Dolphins, really, it was kind of hard because this, this Dolphins team, Ryan, Ryan Tannehill, guys, this guy might be the all-time garbage stats producer in the history of the NFL. <laughs> if you look at his numbers. It'd be a fun list. 33 for 58, 351, three touchdowns and an interception. The gulf between reality of what kind of game he had and what his numbers looked like and what fantasy owners got, Grand Canyon is the distance and the we depth of it. We haven't buried him enough this year for the season he's having. We haven't because when you watch him, he doesn't do anything that is offensive. He's just there. He's playing at a Dalton scale level of performance, but then he'll he'll throw in like a really like one really bad game every month or so. He, like he doesn't it. offend you when you're watching. He just doesn't do anything that lifts them. What he, what is he? gotten better at doing since he entered the league oh, i agree he's nothing. still a bad deep thrower he still has questionable pocket presence and he only throws short passes and he's well, still very sensitive after the game he got yeah annoyed that calvin Pryor he thought was celebrating well we have that hit. actually branded behind the glass and if you're watching on youtube you could watch this and you could listen to it if you're an audio uh file uh can we listen to that brandon or watch it I didn't notice it, honestly. I was just worried about Rashard. I heard some guys talking about it on the sideline, which, you know, that's kind of a classless move to celebrate when a guy's injured. You know, obviously, it was a good hit, clean hit, but, you know, to celebrate when a guy's down, it's kind of a, um, you know, classless move. It was a hit from Calvin Pryor on Rashard um, Matthews early in the game. Uh, and, and after the game then, Greg, and you wrote up the post, uh, it didn't seem, if you were watching the game, Pryor celebrated a little bit, but it wasn't like they were jumping up and down. Once oh. Matthews was gone, it was it was, it was down. They didn't continue he, to celebrate. He had no idea the guy was hurt. He was just celebrating a big hit, and that's after the game. He tweeted out, uh, Calvin Pryor tweeted out, you know, if 
if Ryan Tannehill, you know, didn't want him to celebrate and throw a better pass. Because it's true. That was the ultimate medicine ball. He got his He laid him out. Hurt. Maybe he felt bad about it. I'm sure he did. I feel bad for Tannehill when your offense is running for 12 yards. Well, that's the thing. Like, remember, like, I would say, oh, Dan Campbell, he's the guy that has common sense. You have some good running backs back there. They ran the ball nine times for 12 yards today. They didn't even try to establish the run. You got Tannehill throwing freaking 58 passes. That's, there's no way to win that way. Well, that's on Campbell, but I don't, I don't know how it breaks down in the building, but it's also on Bill Lazor, who over the past two years, his responsibility was to develop Ryan Tannehill. And if it's not happening, it's not Dan Campbell's fault over the last two months. It's this offense that... You blow up on the ground one week. You rush for 12 yards the rest. Is it all the Jets' defense? Maybe it was this week. Yeah, the know. Jets' run defense hasn't been lights out the last no, five, six No, it's a little touch weeks. and go. How about, you know, Brandon Marshall dominating Brent Grimes, who's had a rough couple weeks Ooh, against Brent two Grimes. of the best receivers in the league, but just getting I, run up and down. I checked with Wes before I sent a tweet out. It, can a wide receiver put a clown suit on a cornerback? I oh, thought yeah. maybe that was a trenches thing, but no. Uh, you can, according to Wes, and that's exactly what happened. Grimes was not quick enough or physical enough to handle Marshall, who probably could have had 200 yards receiving if Fitz uh, looked at him more. Brent, Brent Grimes wasn't quick enough to handle Brandon Marshall? That's pretty <laughs> damning. The Dolphins are what we thought the Chiefs would be in that, like, they are the most forgettable team in, in the AFC right now. They're just there. They're not really terrible at anything in particular. They're not good. They're definitely not good at anything in particular right now. They're just kind of a forgettable team that's going to be changing. Kind of like last year's Dolphins. And the year before. In the year before Every that. year before that. Uh, moving on, the Bengals' losing streak is over. Andy Dalton threw three touchdowns, two to old friend A.J. Green, who's been a little quiet this year, but he had two touchdowns in this game and route to an easy 31-7 win over, sorry, Greg, the disappearing St. Louis uh, Rams. Mark Sessler, just when people were starting to wonder if since he was falling into a funk, here comes Nick Foles to make everything better. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's great medicine for this team, and, you know, it's – Cincinnati, we talked about them coming off the Cardinals game last week. It was a loss, but it was them telling us that we're not the Bengals from the year before. They put up a big offensive showing. I think it says a lot about Cincinnati to come out and stamp St. Louis the way they did today. Todd Gurley doesn't have a big day. Really, it also boils down to the Rams having nothing on offense, including a bad quarterback. But the Bengals take care of business. And I believe uh, after the game, a reporter asked about the effort level of the St. Louis Rams to Jeff Fisher, who's a little, who's a little Teflon. Let's let's face it, for a team that's had very little success in Fisher's tenure there, and this is how Jeff reacted to it. Obviously, uh, stressful times in the Fisher house. Anyone implies that it's an effort issue, then they can kiss my. Ass. Okay, because there's no effort problems on this with this team. Okay, that's what happens when teams when you lose four in a row. People say it's effort. Come to practice, watch this team play, and ask any other opposing, opponent or opposing coach. It's not an effort issue right now. It's execution. It's not an effort issue. It's right. a, an intelligence issue. It's, That's a straw man. It's a coaching issue. It's a plain smart issue. Like, great, your, your team flies around and gets 15-yard penalties after every, like, 10th play. Congratulations. I, you haven't fixed an offense for four years. That's the issue. Third think, time in four weeks that Jeff Fisher has come out and railed against either another human being or some philosophy or an idea in his press conference, he's becoming the NFC's Rex Ryan mm. without a good team, same as Rex Ryan. I think there's a lot of valid criticism about Jeff Fisher and his Rams. I've never heard anybody question their effort. I think that's just a straw man argument, so he doesn't have to, he doesn't have to answer for all the mistakes he makes. I mean, this was not that long ago that the Rams are an exciting team that seemed to be on the rise. And now four losses in a row. Todd Gurley no longer is taking the NFL by storm. It's not all his fault, obviously. Uh, this team is broken down in every way. I wonder if Jeff Fisher can lose his job because the owner seems to like him. The general manager, Everybody who I think isn't him. going anywhere, likes him. They're moving to Los Angeles. But if I hear another person say, well, you got to keep Fisher coming to Los Angeles. USC guy, he's from – it's like – what? You it doesn't a, matter. You need to have a coach that's from the city and like knows how to get you know down the 405, the fastest way to the stadium. It doesn't <laughs> matter. You coach, you know, that has nothing to do with it that he's from LA. That's a, that's a, people that don't live in LA. I didn't know that until know this until I moved here and really started to understand the culture of the city. 
is that USC is a really big deal. Like, there might not be an NFL team, but there is a pro team. It's USC football. And as you saw this weekend where they put it on UCLA. But, they, you know, everyone thinks just because Jeff Fisher has ties there that for some reason he needs to be here. Now, I, I don't buy into any of that. I think it speaks gosh. more to the fact that what we've watched with the Rams is no matter what they produce under Fisher year after year, it's – you know, Wes, Les Snead is this magnificent GM. Jeff Fisher's got this team cooking. We fall for it year after year. They are not even a 7-9 and nine squad this year. They're probably a lot worse. And you traded for Nick Foles. That was a decision you made as an organization. Whether, whether you are Sam Bradford or not, we went out and traded for Nick Foles, and he's the biggest they, problem you have on offense. They do kind of, and we've been to the combine, and we cover the NFL in the offseason when everybody's going to win the Super Bowl. But there is an air of confidence that pours out of that building where they really, you almost get the sense that they think that they've figured things out and they're a step ahead of everyone. And then the season comes, and then all of a sudden it's Thanksgiving, and they're buried in their division. And it's like same old Rams. It never changes. They're one of the worst offenses every year under Jeff Fisher. <laughs> that never changes. And they, you, like you said, they went out and traded for Foles. They also drafted Greg Robinson two years ago, put three rookies in the starting lineup, or three first for three first-year offensive linemen starters, and their offensive linemen is trash. Well, that, that's the thing. It's an offense league. Like, I love it when people say, well, it's, you know, 40% offense, 40% defense. No, it's an offensive league because if you have a good offense, that's going to be more consistent year after year. So what you get when you hire Jeff Fisher is a bad offense for the last 15 seasons. I mean, how many winning seasons has he had since McNair retired? A couple, and that's it. And he's had a lot of cracks at the plate. One thing on the Bengals, I think their defensive improvement this year, it's all Geno Atkins. Mm. That guy, yeah. he's, he better be a pro, an all-pro this year. Yeah, Kevin Patron is right up. Uh, liked it so much, Atkins' play. He put his name in all caps with a triple slammer. That's journalism lingo for exclamation points. It is? Yes. <laughs> triple slammer. That's, well, just slammer. Geno Atkins is so good, he turned Kevin Patra into like a 13-year-old girl. <laughs> That's exactly what happened. <laughs> By the way, Tyler Eifert, who left this game after suffering a stinger, uh, now has 12 touchdowns after another one. I don't think anybody saw uh, him being quite that good. Moving on, Phillip Rivers threw four touchdown passes without an interception, outplaying his uh, contemporary Blake Bortles in a 31-25 Chargers win over the Jaguars, uh, who have seen their playoff hopes dim to a flicker. Tough loss for uh, the Jaguars, who, again, listen, every time you want to buy in on them and think that they can start making a move and progress as a team, they let the Chargers beat them in their own house. A Chargers team that lo had lost six in a row and week after week has shown that they do not know how to close out games despite having a great quarterback in Phil Rivers, and this was a tough loss for the Jaguars. I mean, I look as much on their defense. You give up 31 points. This is meant to be the Gus Bradley team, what, three-plus years in, where we're supposed to see the earmarks of what happened in Seattle and what that defense is all about. They're not an excellent team when it comes to disrupting quarterback play, and you're giving up points in, in bushels week after week. It's, it's, I mean, it's happened so often. I mean, how this, this is the NFL, a guy – Coaches a great defense, uh, and then he gets brought somewhere else, and you're expected to build that up. It, I guess it's just not that easy because you see this time and time again. A lot of guys fail. And I think they've overachieved with the talent they have overall, and they keep adding okay pieces. Telvin Smith, Aaron Colvin. You know, Derek Marks was a great player, but he's been gone all year because of an injury. He's their best player. But they haven't had home runs in the draft. They just haven't on offense. They've had a, a bunch of singles, and they've now been there long enough with Caldwell that – I mean, he knows this. you, you got to get some Pro Bowl players on defense, and they just never get any. And they haven't developed any. You know, Seattle drafted a bunch of guys in the fourth and fifth round and, and developed them into Pro Bowlers. And That's why you don't want to play the Chargers. The Chargers are a three-win team right now. But, you know, I'd, much, I'd be so much more afraid of playing the Chargers on a week-to-week -week basis than, than the Jaguars. For yeah. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, because it's Phillip Rivers. Rivers. Yeah, so exactly. It's all Rivers, and you see – in this, I, I called him a contemporary. He's not a contemporary. He's much older um, than um, Blake Bortles, Philip Rivers. But you see what happens in uh, the red zone in this game where Philip Rivers goes down there and scores four touchdowns. Blake Bortles gets four uh, field goals. And on top of it, he has two penalties. This is, it really is, what do we call it, the Bortles coaster. 
uh, in Jacksonville. My worst nickname ever. Yeah, you know. Derivative doesn't really. Another workshopper. <laughs> yeah, workshop that one. Another workshopper. Better than, what was it, The Joy of Rex? What was it? Rex, Rex Crimes? Rex Crimes. I like that one. And it, it paid So it's kind of gross. It's kind of gross. But Bortles had two penalties where he crossed the line of scrimmage and threw, threw a pass into the end zone with short circuited drives. He threw a terrible interception. He also had a, a really pretty touchdown pass to Julius Thomas uh, that kept them in the game. Uh, um, in the beginning of the fourth quarter. So up and down uh, Blake Bortles' day. And Julius Thomas, by the way, this was a crazy stat. Uh, I think Connor uh, or um, brought it to the surface in our Slack client. Uh, quit slacking. Sign up for Slack today. We'll take literally any sponsors we can get, guys. Uh, <laughs> but uh, what Connor, that was a 100-yard touchdown tight end performance for the Jacksonville Jaguars. The first since 2000, Kyle Brady, and that's the only other one. There's only been two. Doesn't say much. Hundred yards in a TD. Lewis. Hundred, hundred yeah. yards in a TD. They've been in the NFL since 1995. The Jaguars, and they've only had two guys do it, and one of them happened today. Let me ask you a question, Mark. We've made the comparison to the 1995 Browns for the Chargers. Does it get to a point where the atmosphere at that home field becomes so poisonous that they're better off playing on the road? Well, I mean, we've talked about their home field if you want to call it that forever, that it's like 40% the visiting team in big games week after week. I, I don't think it's nearly as poisonous because the passion in the 95 Brown situation with that home, that, that crowd, that city that was duped and suddenly find out the team is going at coming off a playoff season is going to Baltimore versus the chargers and right. a stadium that doesn't fill it. Cleveland fills their stadium every week, no matter how bad they are. I see literally no comparison between this chargers team and the 95 Browns inside the organization, in the stadium, or on the field. Nobody goes into Everbank Field and comes out alive. That's what I like to say. I've never watched a game before. Well, I, I feel for you, Dan. I'm not sure how to respond to that. All right, moving on. Uh, the New York Giants had a chance to seize control of the craptastic NFC East with a win over the Redskins on Sunday in FedEx Field. Did they do it, Wes? Of course not. Washington scored the game's first 20 points, held on a 2014 win. They move into a first-place tie in the division of 5-6. and six. Oh, my God, 5-6. and six. Greg, this division keeps getting worse and worse and worse, but let's give Jay Gruden's team some credit. Wes, I still don't see him at the podium celebrating an NFC's title. I can't see it. I won't allow the it favorites. to come into my mind. But They're the favorites. That was a big win today. They are the slight favorites now because of the schedule. That's they've, the worst thing to be. By the way, they've, they've been the favorites for a while. They're five and six. You just got on me for crowing about a Colts team who's beaten good mm. teams back to back weeks. They are five and six, and they've shown they're a mediocre team. But it's a terrible division. I think eight wins will win this division. They have two left against the Cowboys, which is nice. The Matt Castle them. Cowboys. Right. It's very nicely timed how that's going to work out for them. Uh, the Giants, on the other hand, who look like the next best team in the division, have a pretty, a couple definite losses on the schedule. You know, this was a game where Eli Manning threw two interceptions in the first quarter, but they were just jostled out, and then the Redskins couldn't score on either one of them. And you got a field goals being blocked. But Kirk Cousins is at the point now, he, he's got a little recipe here. If you can hit one pass to Deshaun Jackson, and you can hit one screen pass to Matt Jones where he takes it really long, that's about all you need to do. I'm not making fun of Cousins. They're yeah, laughing are, over you here. You are going out of your way not to give him any credit. No, I'm just saying that's the recipe. He is, he, <laughs> if you want to be generous, he's the new Dalton scale. Because he has very little to do what's going on. He's Ryan Tannehill say, right hey, there. what about me? He has very little to do, <laughs> to do with what's going on. A guy who has shown repeatedly that he can lead fourth quarter game winning drives. Well, in this game, th that's the wrong argument to make because they totally sat on the ball. I, give, I put that on the Didn't he hit a big 20-yard pass to Jordan Reed in the fourth quarter? They, they did drive out the clock at the end, but before that it was 20 to nothing, and they were just biding their time waiting for the game to end. Eli Manning hits a Hail Mary for one touchdown, and then Odell Beckham makes maybe the catch of the year with a one-handed touchdown grab, gets it to within 20 to 14. Yeah, but, great. Yeah. yeah. Twitter, calm down. Yeah, it was a great catch. Yeah, maybe. Well, the everybody's immediately like, that was even better than the first one. Let's just say it was well, a great wants catch. the next best. Was not better than the first no, one. It was, was a great, it was a great catch. It was one of the, in the mix. I, I like Jay Gruden, though. I think they're coaching their talent up about as much as they can. And I like the fact he went for fourth and goal early in, or late in the first half, and Kirk Cousins got it over the end zone. I think that was the biggest play of the game. I think some other version of this Redskins team could have two wins. If you put a different coach in and you put a different quarterback in, that 
they don't even get to the table where they are right now. And they're, they're probably an 8-8 eight and eight team, and that's why last week we were shredding the Redskins. This week we have to look at them a little bit differently. Next week, who knows what we'll get. That's what this entire division is. But I'm not going to sit around and say Kirk Cousins is some sort of nightmare. I mean, no. he's had. Well, he called him the new I Dalton just said scale. He might be, and if you want to be generous, he could be the new Dalton scale. He's, he, he's, he's also late middle he, of the pack. We want to assess everyone all the time, and I get that. That's what we have to do. But it's like he's a young quarterback just beginning Youngish. his career as a starter. All right, but he's he sat on the bench behind RG three for a Correct. long time, and you're going to go through these growing pains with an offense that's still figuring out what they are. I think to some degree. The Redskins are the best home team in this division. They're five and one at home. And their three remaining road games are at Jay Cutler, at Sam Bradford slash Mark Sanchez, and at Matt Castle. Well, that, that's the thing. The Redskins, who are the best team? This is the, by far the best team they've beaten at the home. That, that's how easy this NFC East, it's amazing how bad this division is. Well, I, mean, they, the I don't want to give them too much credit for being a seven-win team. Like, you're not right, going to give them credit for anything ever. Well, I'm, I'm, my thing I'll say, those, <laughs> who are the three opponents again? They play the Bears, the Eagles, the backsliding Eagles, yeah. and the Dunn Cowboys. And I'll give the Redskins credit. They are winning more games than I thought they would to this point. But would you be really stunned if they lost any of those games either? Any of them? No, not at all. I wouldn't be stunned wouldn't be if stunned they lose any game ever. Or if the Giants won four straight because the Giants are the weirdest team out there. And they still have the ability in games to do stuff that you couldn't expect. I would be surprised because they are so flawed. They don't have any run game. They don't have any. They lost another offensive the lineman. They lost they? their best player oh, today, other than Eli Manning, Dom- Dominique Rogers, Cromartie. Well, wait, How long is back, he out? He came back in the game. That's my point. Uh, we move on now to uh, uh, the other late game. It was not the blowout many expected, but the Arizona Cardinals are now 9 and 2 after a. A uh, hard-fought 19-13 win over the San Francisco 49ers on Sunday at the Big Bell Bottom. That's how you pronounce no it. No one's ever going to say it. Mark, the Niners did a nice job uh, bringing the Cardinals down to earth, but when it mattered most, Arizona got it done. That's why they're the team of ATL. Yeah, and they deserve to be. I mean, I, I see good news and bad news for Arizona. Number one, you know, as we talked about on NFL Now before the podcast, they showed that they can win a game like this. This was an ugly game. Bruce Arian said it was hard sledding. It was not sexy whatsoever. Perfect way to describe it. I mean, it just wasn't. Everything that we've come to expect from the Cardinals wasn't happening for three-plus quarters. At the end, though, with the game on the line, a 14-play, 85-yard drive that eats up eight minutes off the clock. It's the longest drive of the year. It basically put the 49ers out of business. So that's the good thing. They showed us they can win in a game like this, and they might need to win another one like this in the playoffs. The bad thing for me, Chris Johnson goes out with a knee injury. Ellington, Andre Ellington goes out with a foot injury, both to the locker room. They Oof. don't return. It sounds like from Carson Palmer, it's not official. We don't know. Hinted that they could miss some time. And without their ground game looking as dynamic as it has, and Chris Johnson hasn't been himself in the entire month of November, but still, Palmer was back there getting hit. I mean, you just don't want to put it all on Carson Palmer, and that's what happened. The big plays were drying up to some degree. And the 49ers, probably one of the most frustrating games for a 49ers fan in ages. 13 penalties. That's they all came right. at the worst time. Well, that was why it was, it was the longest mess. drive of the season. It was like seven penalties on the 49ers, and every one seemed to be on third down when they were about to get off the field. And so they kept just extending Cardinals. Oh. It's amazing. Their defense played great. You they mentioned did. the running game. Their running game was not doing anything before the injuries, and they had a lot of chances in short yardage, which has been a problem for the Cardinals, and they just couldn't pick up a yard for the life of it. I was, I was amazed it was a game. That's why I think that Chris Johnson and Andre Ellington, if they miss some time, could sneakily be a good thing for the Cardinals because David Johnson needs to be the goal line short yardage back for this team. He's 225 pounds. When they had a game early in the year and they gave him two goal line chances, he converted both of them and they got away from that. But if you're a Cardinals fan, I think you have to kind of you have to be happy that you you haven't even hit your stride yet. You haven't played to your potential, and you're beating Seahawks, oh, yeah. Bengals, and 49ers in close games. They have a few things to work on. They could be more they could be more efficient in the red zone again with the short yardage issues. If they fix these things, they're going to be even better. But there is it is an issue with Chris Johnson though. Almost six yards per <clears throat> carry in October. Barely three in November, and so you may be looking at a running back that a couple weeks off would help. Could be nearing the end part of his productive season. And, yeah, It'll it might have been else. a nice little flash for a former star, and now he's back to what he was with the Jets. It sounds and looks very familiar, the, the stat line. Honey Badger, Mark. Ooh. Another monster day, huh? Well, we've been talking about Honey Badger all year. 
And it's for me, it's the stuff that doesn't even show up. As an, it, he has an interception today, but it's a tackle he made off a gadget play that the 49ers tried to run that blew up the entire drive and basically put the San Francisco 49ers in a hole. He's all over the field, leads the team in tackles, and they can just use him in such different ways. But the team in general uses all their defensive players very well, and I think that it's his versatility is really a symbol of what Bruce Arians can do on defense. I think Torrey Smith beat him deep, and I was when he did, I was like, I was trying to remember. I can't remember the last time someone beat Matthew over the top. And Matthew was right there at the catch point. Right. I also like, uh, I think I saw it again today at one point when I was watching uh, he has a sneaky ability to, like, wallop people. He's oh, not yeah. a big oh, yeah. guy, but and he can really uh, jack up a guy oh, yeah. um, if you uh, if he catches a guy the right way. So, yeah, he's a fun player. You think he's o- over Watt right now, defensive MVP? Well, no, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, I don't care about these awards, but I just think he deserves to be put. <laughs> I don't because well, you okay. can't say that he's as dominant as Watt. That would be a little bit foolish. But for what, for, to look where this team is, I don't think that they're the same team. You mentioned it with the Steelers. You put Matt, you put put Tyron with you on the Steelers. They're a different defense. So yeah, I think he and Josh Norman have been far and above the crowd at defensive back this year. I agree. I also it's hard to make an argument that JJ West not the best defensive player in the no, league. I agree. Is, and he that's, is, that's what I mean. And he is. He, he will be every year. Which takes us to Sunday Night Football and an instant classic, gentlemen, between the Denver Broncos and the New England Patriots. The now, no longer can you say undefeated mm. New England Patriots, Greg Rosenthal, because the Broncos got him. A 30-24 wild comeback win at Mile High in the snow, a game in which the uh, Patriots had a 21-7 lead uh, well into the second half. Seemed to be in a very good place to move, to, uh, move on to 11-0. Chris Harper muffs a punt. The Broncos go in. They uh, kick a field goal. They take the lead. The Patriots then come back, kick a field goal. We go to overtime, and then C.J. Anderson in uh, the Broncos' first possession of overtime after the Patriots go three and out, goes around left, the left side on a pitch on third and short, takes it the distance for the touchdown. Game over, undefeated, season over. Rob Gronkowski lost for the game and who knows how long with a knee injury. Ooh, the throne of sleaze, Greg. <laughs> A tough day for Patriots. Don't try to, you know, don't enjoy it so much. I mean, the second. I enjoy everything but the Gronk injury. The the second Emmanuel Sanders catches that pass down the sideline, Hansis is honking about Butler Island. Give me a break. (laughs) You brought that on yourself. An an incredible game. Uh, The Giants Patriots game is one of the games of the year, and I think this is a game that we'll remember for a long time. Not the least of which is that Brock Osweiler might have ended Peyton Manning's career. I mean, that's a, that almost feels like a secondary Absolutely. story, but I think that's basically what Brock Osweiler did on Sunday night. The Gronk injury is the main talking point to me, though, because the Patriots can afford a loss. I don't think a loss is that big of a deal for him, but if Gronk is injured for a long time, they can't afford that. Yeah, Ian Rappaport reported that initial tests rule out a serious injury, which is the best news possible considering the scene we saw on the field with him writhing in pain. Writhing in pain, the cart comes out. The worst scene you could have when the other team players on the other team are patting you on the helmet. It, it looked like a season-ending injury. Let's let's just call it like it was initially. So was at, at the time of this taping, it's not going to be that. It looks like uh, we'll see what happens. I mean, complete game changer. We were talking about it. If he were to go out for the year, it it's not good for football fans in general. Whether or not you like the Patriots, you buy into New England. The idea of losing Gronk is just another good player being stripped away. Now, if he's going to be back, who knows what, in a couple weeks, this train keeps going. You, you, the AFC is just very weak. The Patriots can lose a game or two here and probably still keep a first-round seed, if not the second but round But things get interesting now because now they're 10-1. and one. The Broncos are 9-2 and two, but have the tiebreaker. And the Patriots are now, as we know, a compromised team. And, you know, we have no idea how long Gron- Gronk's out. But let's just say he's out a couple of weeks. The, that's Tom Brady with really no weapons on the field. It's going to be hard for them to – I know their schedule's not that tough, Greg, but it's going to be hard for them to keep rolling through with wins in this compromised state. In, in theory, yes. But in reality, they were in Denver against the best defense in the league, against an offense that suddenly is running the ball well, a quarterback in Brock Osweiler that's clearly an upgrade over Peyton Manning, and they're going to win that game on the road if Chris Harper doesn't fumble a punt. They had a very good effort, I would say, overall. Tom Brady, 
we'll go back and watch it, but when you're setting your team up to win, you have three touchdowns and that kind of yardage against this defense in this situation, the snow, that's Tom Brady at his peak. So if Tom Brady's at his peak, we don't know how injured Dante Hightower is. That was another injury they had. But if he comes back, Jamie Collins is back. I think they're in a good position. I think they're playing good football. They beat the Bills last week. People say that's a bad bad game that they had. But it's like they won the game at home against a tough division opponent. They can I mean, win games. But what we saw in the brief time without Gronk, there's nothing going on with that offense. Now, it was in bad weather. I'm just saying how you stripped every weapon away from Tom Brady. He can't do it alone. He's got to have someone to throw to. But do you doubt him? Do you doubt I, that? If he, he doesn't have away? Gronk, I def- yeah. if he doesn't have Gronk, I definitely doubt him. Right. Gronk's the most since he entered the league. Gronk is the most valuable non-quarterback in the NFL. When I, they've gone out in the playoffs, it's been with Gronk without out Gronk. Of the lineup. But do I doubt Tom Brady? Of course I don't. It's just that in this passing league and what the NFL is, you've got to have some. Huge. Weapons. Well, that's why I think it's one of the more impressive performances we've seen by Brady. He went down the field with very little time without Gronk. They botched a a clock situation at one point where they didn't realize the clock was running. He basically had one play to get 15 to 20 yards, and he got it with a great out route to Brandon LaFell. He somehow engineered that drive with Chandler and LaFell as the main guy. Well, what about happening in overtime, though? Right. All right, then you don't even see the Patriots have those drives. He took a sack, and, you know, you got to give credit to the Denver side of the ball. I mean, not only did they get back in this game where a game that looked like it was close to over, they they came all the way back, tie the, take the lead, actually, and then they, they lose the toss in overtime, get the three-and-out stop, get the sack of Tom Brady, and then what they did was they leaned on C.J. Anderson in a big spot there, and he came through. If C.J. Anderson can run the ball like he was doing last year, and Osweiler looks like a better option than Peyton Manning was, certainly before he got hurt, the Broncos are going to be okay on offense. Well, Anderson and Hillman are averaging a yard and a half more per carry with Osweiler than they did, than they did with Peyton Manning, which I think speaks volumes about how much better of a fit Brock Osweiler is for the offense. And I, I look at the production team and the announcers from NBC, what they were saying out of the gate was they were basically speaking what I think the coaches told them all week long was Brock Osweiler runs this offense well. He's helped wake up the ground game because you have actual rollouts that people buy into, your play action that people buy into. And this is want they want to be a run-based team from here on out. And so when you talk about oh, there's a big decision ahead with Peyton Manning. It is only a big decision because of who Peyton Manning is and the legacy, but in terms of their play on the field right now, it's an easy decision. Right. I mean, all you got to do is look at that throw that he made to Sanders down the sideline. Or you can look at, I think it was one of, if not his first completions of the game, which was a 25-yard ho- you know, bullet right through the middle of the Patriots' defense, and that's where arm strength shows up. I mean, Brock Osweiler, I think, showed – a lot to be calm and not make mistakes in his first start, but he showed a lot more uh, in this start. It was interesting, too. There's still a work in progress. I believe uh, that Demarius Thomas had one reception on 13 targets. So, obviously, this is still... <laughs> Got to work that out. That one was big, though. It, yeah, it was a a, win. That was a huge uh, one catch that he did have, but they're still working things out. Uh, I mean, but let's, you know, let's go back to the throne of these a little bit here. Oh. Let's talk about it. Well, you, as a Patriots fan... Uh, Brandon, do we have any throne of ease? Uh, yeah, let's let's do this the is right this way. Really, the time to be on the this, throne of this ease. This is uh, throwing watch something the... in quick over here. No. This is called the throne of ease. There you go, you guys ready? Yes. Now, are you secretly happy a little bit that you got the loss out of the way? You don't have to carry that burden into January. You could just try to be the best team. Let's assume that you got Gronk back for a January run. Let's say. Edelman, he's scrappy, he gets back. Is this maybe a good thing for the Patriots? Yeah, I talked about it with you guys. I didn't think it was a good thing for them to get through the season undefeated, that the burden of that seemed to really weigh on the 2017. And even more selfishly, as a fan, I think I could take them going out in the playoffs again. If they went undefeated in the regular season and then lost again, for some reason that would just be the worst possible result. Now, I'm in much better mood because since the game ended, we're already hearing these positive reports about Gronkowski. That's really the only thing. If they can get the one seed, all they got to do is really – at the Jets is pretty difficult. You got the Texans at home. Those are their two toughest games left. They can probably run the table. And even if they do lose a game, I'd I'd like their chances to get the one seed. Belichick doesn't like all of his first-place teams. There are some years where – 
He can tell by his comments that he's not thrilled with them. <laughs> After this game, he said, I have all the respect in the world for this football team, the way they compete. You can tell he loves this collection of players. And I, I'm with you. Like, if you get Gronk and Edelman back by the first round of the playoffs or the, or the bye week, you gotta, you got to still like the Patriots. But that's a huge caveat. You have to get Gronk back. You're going to be okay, buddy. I, I will be fine personally. Here's a bigger concern. A bigger concern at one point in the fourth quarter – uh, a Patriots got a positive chunk play, and Mark just, it came out of him. Mm. He goes, I love this team, referring to the Patriots. Curse of Sessler, potentially. <laughs> it, was, it was a play later, play or two later. That's hogwash. That As the, the curse of Sessler now moved from Cleveland How, on, though, over Jim. Foxborough. It was last February mm, exactly. that I was feeling a little bit of Patriots love, uh, and that did not The nadir that. of the Around the NFL group, yes, I, I remember it well. My thing is this, would you rather, I, I want to enjoy watching the sport at some point, so tonight <laughs> I did. So, uh, we're 24 <laughs> hours away from you telling me to get excited about the Browns playing the Ravens on Monday Night Football. These are two good teams. This was a great exactly. game. Exactly. You know, he didn't he didn't curse them at all last year. Oh, anything, it's just the theory. Some, That's all it is. I didn't say it. some good mojo. They needed that in the playoffs. I didn't last say he definitely, year. Mark, is de definitely cursed the Patriots. Well, the intonation is offensive. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I, I think Sessler saved Gronk. I mean, otherwise, that could have been mm, a, a season. That's a good way to look at it. it that way. That's we a way to look at it. I was already convincing myself. Well, wouldn't it be the greatest Belichick Super Bowl ever if they did it without Gronk? I was just already nice trying try. to twist myself into convincing. Yeah, him. nice try. Was that the game of the year? Was I that the game so. of the year? Yeah. No. Spirit. It wasn't even the game of the day. The Seahawks Steelers game was wow. more fun to watch. That was a pretty there was damn a good lot, game. There was a lot going on in this drama. Game. I think the Giants Patriots game for just pure entertainment was crazy and tough. I, I wouldn't even put that in the top ten. Greg's like well, eleven way tie every Patriot game. Every dome game loses points for me because it's in a dome. Mm. But this game in with the, the snow. snow falling, this is this a lot is of fantastic. implications. This felt like a big. By game. the way, you talked about the the Patriots yes. having to win some close games or win against an easy schedule. The Broncos and Bengals play each other still, and the Broncos also have to play the Steelers. And this, Bron this, this Broncos, ain't over yet. This Broncos team is much scarier now that they have this running game and this offense. The defense hasn't been quite as... Well, they'll get the Marcus Ware been, back. They're going to get the Marcus Ware back. Hmm. So, yeah, so a lot to talk about. Here's the good thing. We'll be back in two days, our Tuesday show, with our good friend Colleen Wolf is going to join us on Tuesday this week, and we'll unpack more. I'm sure we'll talk more of Throne of Ease and more AFC playoff picture, maybe more about this potential situation going on with Sessler and the Pats, what it can mean for the future of the organization. You know, it's all out there. And we're going to talk Monday Night Football with the Browns. That's all coming up on the next show. Why would we do that last thing? Yeah, anyway. that'll be a great minute of the show. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's it for Sunday's edition of the Around the NFL podcast. Thank you for everyone for listening, watching on YouTube or NFL Now, wherever. However you consume us, thank you. Until then, this is Dan Hansis signing off for Quiet Storm. The mailman. The boss. <laughs> Branded behind the glass. He's, he needs a nickname. Till Tuesday.